All right, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Um, welcome to the uh, 30th Annual uh, School of Natural Sciences Senior Symposium Day. Uh, my name is Bilal Shibaro, and I'm a faculty member in Computer Science Department and the uh, director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Science, also known as I4. Uh, on the behalf of our wonderful I4 team, Dr. Rebecca Thompson, Dr. Uh, Andrea Holgado, Dr. Paul Walter and Dr. Chuck Hauser, we'd like to welcome you in celebrating uh, this kickoff event of our Senior Symposium Day. Um, to start off, I really want to ask you kindly to uh, give a round of applause for our senior students who we are celebrating their uh, senior projects and, and research work today. So please. <laughs> Wow, that clapping sound is so cool. You know, I imagine I'm gonna see virtual claps. Uh, it's so good, really, to see you in the same room and not on Zoom. Um, we're all tired from the words of, your mic is muted, I can't see your screen, or, you know, can everybody please have your cameras on? Everybody's cameras on today, wonderful. Speaking of cameras, uh, we are recording this event, and we're also recording it on a 360 camera. So um, this is recording you all in 360 view, so my best advice for you is to always keep smiling the entire event. Um, I hope you had the opportunity to uh, scan and go uh, the QR code uh, for attendance purposes, and please expect a survey uh, early next week uh, about this event. Uh, I uh, want to really uh, say thank you to all of you for being here. I want to thank our NSI staff, especially Lindsay Young, for helping us organizing this event. Uh, and special thank you for Dr. Santiago Toledo for also organizing and helping us with this event and inviting our keynote speaker. And with this, I want to invite Dr. Toledo to introduce our keynote speaker. Hi everybody, good afternoon and welcome to the 30th Annual Senior Symposium. This is awesome. This is a true celebration of the accomplishments and academic accomplishments of all of the students here in the natural sciences. We're ex extremely excited about this. Today I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ilya Finkelstein. So um, I'll tell you a little bit of stories. I kind of have a chance and the pleasure to have known him personally. But uh, I don't want to screw up his trajectory, so I'm going to start reading about some of his accomplishments. Um, he, uh, he earned his BS degree from the University of California, Berkeley in 2001, got his PhD in chemistry from, the University of, from Stanford University in 2007, and did his postdoctoral training in molecular biophysics from Columbia University Medical Center in 2012. That same year, he joined the faculty at the University of Texas, where he's currently holding a position as an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Biosciences. Uh, he is the Lorene Morrow Kelly Faculty Fellow. His, team, his team's work is beautifully interdisciplinary in nature, which is actually well aligned with the spirit of the I4 Institute, and we're very excited to have him here today. His work focuses on bioinformatics, molecular biophysics, biomedical engineering, and computer science. Some of the specifics of his work are focused on the development of biophysical tools to understand how molecular machines edit and repair our genomes, including single molecule biophysical studies. Also, applications on CRISPR, adaptive immunity, mammalian gene editing, and the mechanism of genome maintenance. As a chemist, some of these things actually are a little bit obscure to me. He's been the recipient of numerous awards. Um, to mention just a few, in 2013, he was named a prodigy by the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science and here in Texas. In 2015, he received the prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award. And in 2021, very recently, the Welsh Foundation named him the Norman Hackerman Award in Chemical Sciences. This award recognizes the accomplishments of chemical scientists in Texas and is designed to encourage scientists who are embarking in careers dedicated to increasing our fundamental understanding of chemistry. For this award, Dr. Finkelstein was recognized for his innovative methods to understand how cells repair DNA and maintain integrity on their genetic information, with the ultimate goal of improving the efficacy and safety of gene editing. Additionally, and is the work that he's going to tell us about today, the Welsh Foundation acknowledged and highlighted Dr. Finkelstein's lab work on the development of critical reagents for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. In collaboration with colleagues, with colleagues at UT, Dr. Finkelstein and his lab worked on the optimization for the production of the viral spike protein 
which is a critical component for the COVID-19 vaccine. On a personal note, I actually have the chance of knowing Dr. Finkelstein. Uh, he's an avid runner, and I've attempted to be an avid runner myself. He's a self-declared weekend warrior. He goes around and runs around like crazy, and he can boast a current marathon record time of three hours and 11 seconds. I will always hold those 11 seconds against him because he's, always, he's very upset about that, so I like to joke with him about that. That's an amazing time. To give you some perspective, that's a mile running at a pace of six minutes and 53 seconds for a total of 26.2 miles. So just think about that. That's pretty insane. So it is really cool because in the mornings, we get out there in the morning, run at 5.30, and it's often very common to hear uh, Ilya talking about the biochemical processes of running. So he's always talking about this and like why it matters, and I'm always listening behind. And then, and then he also likes to talk about this debate that is ongoing about the power of the mind and the body. So that's really interesting. However, I never get to hear the whole story because he's faster than me. So I like hear half of the story and then he just runs away and I'm chasing behind him. So just impressive. Um, I and others greatly appreciate his supportive attitude and his great sense of humor. And especially in those early morning runs when we kind of need that extra push, he's always there with his healthy competitiveness, competitiveness to push us all to do better. I can't wait to hear your signs. And without further ado, I want to give him a round of applause to Dr. Ilya Finkelstein. Thank you, Santiago. That introduction was too kind. You should know a gentleman never shares their marathon time. <laughs> just, just some <laughs> Anyways, thank you all for coming out here. I really appreciate you being in person. I, too, am excited about standing in front of you instead of being in front of a Zoom window. I think this is my first seminar back in person. We did a lot of Zoom seminars, so I'm excited, too. And today I'm going to tell you about our work on SARS-CoV-2, which is, as you heard, really not my forte. This is something I got into out of necessity, like many of us who had to switch gears when the pandemic hit. So I thought I'd start by giving you a little picture of what um, the infectious moment of SARS-CoV-2 infection into the cell looks like. Here's the viral membrane on your left. On your right is the cell. Uh, this protein is the spike protein that decorates the virus. And this is the point, this is an artistic rendering uh, based on structures solved at UT Austin, uh, of the, the point where the spike protein makes first contact with a cell surface receptor called ACE2. Important note, not all of you are biologists. If I slip into jargon, please stop me. I would really appreciate that. So all of these words were foreign to me as well because I'm not a virologist or a vaccinologist. Uh, we got into this um, during the pandemic. And I just wanted to give you a little timeline of how this happened. Okay, so in December 21st, 2019, there's a cluster of pneumonia patients identified by the Chinese CDC, Center for Disease Control in China. Very quickly thereafter, the genomes were sequenced, and the causative agent of this unusual pneumonia turned out to be a beta coronavirus family um, particle. The first genome was released by actually, oh, this pointer is dying. If you have a chance to. Uh, the, uh, the first genome was released, again, by a courageous Chinese scientist on January 10th. And um, UT Austin has played a very important part in the global response to the pandemic because uh, we have an actual vaccinologist on campus, Jason McClellan, who on January 20th of 2020 uh, purified and cloned the spike gene or the S protein, this S gene, from the virus. And this is a critical protein that we'll spend the rest of the hour talking about. Okay, very shortly thereafter, one month later, the structure was made available for the global community of this important protein uh, with a specific modification, this 2P or double proline modification. And that modification is going to become important later. Um, two months after all of this started happening, UT Austin shut down, and most of Austin and most of the U.S. shut down as the pandemic was raging. Early in January, I had already understood that this was going to be a big deal and we were heading towards potentially a global cataclysmic event. So we very quickly started working with the labs of uh, Jason uh, McClellan and Jennifer Maynard in chemical engineering, who is an antibody engineer, um, to start building out what we knew would be an important aspect of any kind of vaccine for this uh, viral agent. So as the university was shutting down, we were ramping up. So um, in February, and uh, we already had our kickoff meetings, and by March, we were already working on vaccine antigens to try to get into people and actually into the hands of Moderna and Pfizer um, as quickly as possible. But let me take a step back. Um, 
Let me tell you a little bit about the virus so you understand why the spike protein is going to play such a central role in our discussion today. All right. So uh, why is this thing called a coronavirus, after all? Um, on the top left, you see a picture of uh, a historical picture of a coronavirus um, taken using electron microscopy, a very high resolution microscope. And on the right is a description that the authors gave to that um, image. This was, I think, 1960s. Yes, 1968. They wrote, these particles are more or less rounded in profile, although there's a certain amount of polymorphism. They also have a characteristic fringe of projections, 200 angstroms long, which are rounded or petal shaped. Okay. Um, rather than the sharper point that is in the mix of my my myoxiviruses, this, appears re this appearance recalls a solar corona. So there's the solar corona, and that's why they're called coronaviruses. Because when you look at them on the microscope, they have this spiky projection. This spiky projection is pr precisely that spike protein that we're talking about shown here in the middle in an artistic illustration in green. And now I'm going to show you a little horror movie. Why do we care about the spike protein? Again, this is a simulation based on real structures, but this is how the spike protein acts like a molecular harpoon to get into the cell to inject the viral genome into, our, into the host. So here's how it starts. All right. This is the viral spike protein. It's got two major subunits, S1 and S2. And the little white beans over here are glycans. They're a sugar coat that tries to protect the virus from our antibodies. Um, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein contacts the cell surface receptor. And then check this out. The virus literally harpoons into the cell via the spike protein, via a very large conformational change in the structure of the protein. If this happens in a few places, then there's a zipping up of this alpha helical domain, these little ribbons. And the virus literally pulls together the membranes of the virus and the cell to inject the material. Right? So this is what's happening. And you saw these massive conformational changes that accompany uh, these transitions from what looks like a petal or, a, or maybe a mushroom-shaped uh, form of the spike protein into what is called the post-fusion state, where it, it is now able to capture the membrane of the, cer uh, of the cell. All right. So how come we know so much about this? And why, did we, why were we able to make these vaccines in a year, we meaning the broader scientific community? The reason for that is because SARS-CoV-2 is not the first uh, uh, type of coronavirus that's circulating in humans. Oh, it's playing again. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, a family tree, if you will, a molecular family tree of related um, enveloped RNA viruses, specifically focusing on coronaviruses or COVs. Okay? And they break up into different families, different clades. That's a technical term. Okay? So SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 are in the green petal over there. But other members of this larger family tree are endemic in humans. There's about half a dozen endemic um, coronaviruses in humans. Why do they not cause pandemics? Well, uh, many of them uh, cause common cold-like symptoms. We've had them. We know about them. They're not very severe. Uh, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, is rare and is quite lethal. Okay? It never broke out as a pandemic. It was a localized epidemic in the Middle East. Uh, it's frequently fatal. I think the case fatality rate is something like 30 to 40 percent. And there was some work done on MERS, um, actually by my colleague Jason, uh, that allowed us together as a team to very quickly jump ahead and understand something about SARS-CoV-2. And I also want to remind you, SARS-CoV-1, at the time called SARS-CoV, was a localized epidemic in the early 2000s in Asia. Um, never crossed the uh, border. It wasn't as transmissive as SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 were related viruses. And even around early 2000s, people were working on SARS-CoV-1 uh, countermeasures already. So it was this wealth of fundamental information and work on these uh, other viruses that allowed us to leap forward and try to understand something about how to make an antigen that could go into vaccines quickly. Right? And here's the key point. Um, again, here's a picture of that uh, virus before it contacts and captures the cell, and here's a picture of it after it contacts the cell. Massive conformational change. The virus changes shape, right? Um, these little ribbon diagrams, if you're not used to them, these are alpha helices. And in the pre-fusion state, before cell entry, um, these alpha helices are bent via flexible loops shown in the schematic over here. So the green and the blue 
are two separate helices shown here as, uh, as cylinders, but here as loops. And then note that when um, triggering occurs and this thing goes into a post-fusion state when it's in that harpoon state, this green and blue helices organize into a one very, very long alpha helix. Right. So here's the name of the game in vaccine design. You want to get uh, an immune response. You want to stimulate your own body to make an immune response against the form of the virus that hasn't yet gained entry into your cells. If the virus is already in this shape, if your immune system is recognizing this molecule, it's too late. The virus has already infected you, so there's no point in, it, it is impossible to neutralize it at that point. You want to prevent the virus from going into the state, i.e. you want to have your antibody response, your adaptive immune response, trained against this entry form of the virus, the pre-fusion state. This molecule, however, is metastable. It exists in both states, and it's, it's, on a, it's like on a trigger. It's really, really ready to pop and go into this state, because that's its point. It's trying to get into your body. Well, um, the name of the game in vaccine design, in making antigens, is to stabilize this form by engineering the protein, so that when you present this stabilized form to your body, it can your body can uh, train a strong immune response and capture the majority of the viral particles in this state before they can trigger. All right, so a lot of words. Name of the game, stabilize this thing. How do you stabilize it? Well, you prevent it from undergoing this very large conformational change. And so what we and others had done in the past is look at how to make this thing not change based on really important work from SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and HKU1, which causes the common cold, uh, uh, folks recognize that uh, breaking this transition of this disordered loop into this very ordered alpha helix could be the way to go to prevent this triggering event. So installing specifically prolines at those red positions there allows us to stabilize it. And so there's two prolines that can be installed in those red positions, and they're quite conserved between Mars, uh, MERS and SARS and HKU1. Uh, stabilizes the virus in the prefusion uh, stabilized state. Okay. All right, so this is the structure that uh, UT Austin, Jason, Pul Jason McClellan, UT Austin and his lab put out. And here's a picture of that structure. The virus actually exists as a homotrimer. Um, one of the three subunits is shown in the ribbon diagram. On top is a structure of that domains, key domains in there. I'm just gonna highlight a few important domains for the discussion here. Um, the RBD stands for the receptor binding domain. It's shown in green. Uh, and you can see it's kind of flipped up. As the name implies, the receptor binding domain is the thing that makes contact with the cell, the ACE2 surface receptor on the cell, and begins this triggering process. And also the N-terminal domain, shown on the left in blue, and also colored in blue over here, uh, is very important for training our immune response. And we'll talk about the N-terminal domain later. So, um, by installing two specific prolines at a particular position, somewhere in, actually buried in the S2 core, uh, they were able to trap the virus in this, in this pre-fusion stabilized form. Okay? And it, it was a pretty good first generation design. Um, so this specific design of uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike um, stabilized it in the pre-fusion form. Just two prolines were added in a key position. Okay? This is the virus, uh, the antigen design that's currently used in Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax, and pretty much most, except for AstraZeneca, most of the vaccines out there. All right? So this really, really was important. And this is work that was done in Austin at UT. Okay? Uh, but unfortunately, we knew by February of the beginning of the pandemic that although this was an important and good design, it was a, not the best design we could do. It was what we could do in a month or two months. You had low limit, uh, low yield, it denatured very easily, which if you think about a human therapeutic, it's a big problem, right? We, I don't know if you recall hearing about the cold chain problem. Yes, right? How do you supply something that needs to be at minus 80 degrees to a rural village, maybe in Africa or even in the US? There was a lot of challenges with cold chain delivery. And this was partially due to the instability of this antigen. Uh, and unfortunately, it didn't produce a focused immune response. So just because you can get antibodies against an antigen doesn't mean that those antibodies are going to be neutralizing and they're going to be hitting the protein in the right spots to kill the virus. Right? Nonetheless, this is the antigen that's inside all of us that have been vaccinated. Okay? We immediately set out to generate a second generation um, design. Okay? So this is like challenge one. 
design improved vaccine antigens. Okay? And this was a work that spanned, you know, I, I do nothing. I just email, right? This is my professional job. Um, the faculty here are laughing along because it's true. They know it's true. Uh, this is work that was done by students like you. These are folks who are recent graduate students. And this is a moment in my life that I, I think I'm most proud of my lab. Uh, when the pandemic hit in February and we were starting up this completely new thing, they had their PhD projects going, they had stuff going on in their lives. And I said, okay, guys, I think this is going to be a big deal. You have a decision. You can continue doing what you're doing and finish your projects, or you can drop everything and switch to something completely new. And every single person in my lab said, let's do it. So we all switched and we worked on this literally 24 seven in three shifts. Um, so uh, what we did was we designed a series of very large panel of mutations, um, changes to the virus um, spike protein uh, sequence that we thought could further improve the stability and antigenicity of this molecule. We did a lot of protein engineering approaches, including salt bridges, prolines, disulfides, cavity filling mutations, hydrogen bonds, based on the structures as a structure guided design to try to lock it into that mushroom shape so it doesn't become that extended harpoon shape. We um, performed a lot of biophysical characterization of these variants, and then we did combinatorics to try to figure them out. This was all done, um, again, by a large group of people working as a big team. Um, ultimately, uh, I'll just show you the exciting part. We found mutants that can be further stabilized uh, in temperature, which is very important for cold chain issues, and could produce much higher yields. This is just a protein gel showing this blue band is brighter than the original design, which was the one that was in current vaccines, spike double proline. We had ongoing collaborations with vaccine manufacturers. Um, at that point, unfortunately, even though we delivered this in a month, we could not um, get it into the first gen vaccine clinical trials because they were doing clinical trials at warp speed too, right? So they were slamming this guy into clinical trials. We had something that was already 10 to 30 fold better, but they were, that ship had sailed. So we didn't get into the first gen vaccines. Despite our efforts, we did get into second gen vaccines. So here's an electron micrograph taken by my student showing these little beautiful mushrooms that look like the prefusion stabilized protein that's kind of dense here, but you can see that they're very, very um, monodispersed, very clean protein, very stable protein. And in fact, if you compare the original design that we had over here and you just cool the protein, warm it, cool it, warm it, and do this at, at different temperatures, you can see the original variant starts looking like not so great. Right? You can even see that with the untrained eye. It looks kind of polydispersed, uh, maybe unfolded, little fibrils over here. Whereas our stuff, which we called Hexapro, um, looks like the same throughout. Um, so ultimately, that work um, was really the brainchild of these three students in my lab and other students throughout. Uh, we had some nice papers out of it. That's not really that important. What's important is this. Uh, the work has now um, been adapted by multiple vaccine manufacturers for second-gen vaccines. Uh, it's used extensively for serological applications for uh, you know, antibody-based tests and so on. Where now, I just checked the stats. I'm not running the clinical trials. That's not my expertise. We just provided the protein. But others have taken them up and put them into different delivery vectors. And now there is clinical trials, including phase three trials in five countries globally. Um, and um, so, some really cool kind of fun stuff that I learned, because I'm not a vaccine developer, um, is that it turns out a lot of the aversion people have to vaccines is needle hesitancy. So there's someone in this room right now who's deathly scared of needles. And when you ask them, you don't have to identify. <laughs> when you ask them, oh, you know, why am I doing, why are you not getting vaccinated? They'll say, oh, I'm doing my research or whatever. But really, they're not doing their research. They're just afraid of needles. And it's like a, a real phobia that faces 10 to 15% of the population. So folks have designed um, uh, vaccination patches. These are micro needles. Don't tell the needle folks. But you don't, you don't feel it, right? So these are dipped into our antigen. Right here, these are nanoscopic. That's a 300 nanometer scale bar. Again, this is not our work. 300 nanometer scale bar. These 300 nanometer needles are, um, this, this chip is dipped into our protein and just applied as a dermal patch. Uh, and post-delivery, right? And then you can measure the immune response. And it turns out that you can be self-administered anywhere in a low-resource setting. People don't, th don't feel it. And it, it produces a very strong immune response. So this is a, com a completely different way of reaching a lot of people um, that wouldn't otherwise get vaccinated because they're afraid of needles. 
Not a small problem. Uh, Right. And another important thing here that I want to stress is that others have taken our approach, and because this protein is so stable, you couldn't do this with the original protein, because the second gen design is so stable, they're able to move it in delivery vectors that are much, much cheaper. I don't know if you know how much a vaccine costs the U.S. government, say one of the Moderna vaccines, but it's prohibitively expensive to develop into low and middle income countries, including the challenges of the cold chain delivery problem, right? How do you get a village in Africa a minus 80 degree freezer? to keep the vaccine stocks. You can't, right? So um, uh, a group based on our work uh, developed a vaccine that is made in chicken eggs, just like the flu vaccine. It uses the, the, the flu vaccine technologies, which are well established and distributed globally. The cost per vaccine is now down to 50 cents, which is now uh, a time when we can imagine solving the following gap, right? Here's the gap. This is data that I pulled out yesterday. If you can see this is the vaccine uptake uh, in low and middle income countries. Here's where we are, right? We have uh, now administered almost two doses per person, and we have purchased, stockpiled more than three point, I think five doses per uh, eligible human in the United States. So we're stockpiling massive amounts of vaccines while the developing countries haven't even vaccinated their first uh, frontline medical workers yet today, right? Because A, they can't afford it, and B, the Western world is stockpiling it, and there's not enough capacity still. So this is 15% or so for some of the low-middle-income uh, low countries of their entire population has only one shot. So this pandemic will rage for many, many more years, just not in the West. We've, we've successfully made it a low- and middle-income country back, uh, pandemic. That's what we've done, essentially. That's not right. So we hope that this work will enable the development of cheap vaccines that could bring this threshold up much, much higher. The RNA vaccines aren't going to do it. They're just too expensive. Okay, that's chapter one. You guys have any questions on that? I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Yeah. So the, when you say that the first-gen vaccine is low yield, so what gets injected is the RNA, so it just doesn't translate very effectively? It doesn't translate very effectively. Roughly 50% of the particles that are come out of the spike 2P are already post-fusion, yeah. so your, your immune response is not proper. And in fact, some of the systemic side effects, maybe some of you were sidelined for a few days, right? Yeah. Some of those systemic side effects are because they have to inject more material to get a sufficient immune response, right? And so um, we did some trials with them, and the newer antigens would have produced a similar immune response with uh, a lower injection dose, but there's no business case, right? We talked about this at dinner, too. Those guys will never change their formulation because it's a duopoly, and there's no reason for them to do it. Right? They're going to keep injecting Gen 1 forever. Yeah. Yep. And in fact, some of the low and middle income uh, uh, countries will probably leapfrog in terms of technology, vaccine, vaccine technology. And this happens quite often, right? The early adopters get stuck with the early adopting technology, and then second gen, third gen technologies will filter out into the world. Although I'd much prefer to be on the earlier side of things. Yeah, no, we're, we're locked into what we have, yeah. Which isn't to say that it's bad. No, no. Don't, don't get me wrong, I do a lot of vaccine outreach and you should get vaccinated if you haven't yet. And vaccines work and they significantly reduce your, your yeah. you know, all these things are good. Yeah. It's just interesting how the business side. Yeah, it is interesting. I, as an academic, I've learned a lot about the business side of things. But anyways, um, in parallel with all of this antigen design, we were also doing variant tracing because we knew variants would be important. Someone who studies biology, I know evolution doesn't stop, uh, you know, and in fact, viruses are very good at evolving. So we very rapidly partnered with a colleague, Jim Musser, who runs the Infectious Disease Unit at uh, Houston Methodist Hospital uh, in Houston, and that is a very large hospital system in a very metropolitan city. So we could actually watch the variant sweeps as they were happening in real time. And here my lab's contribution, so they were collecting clinical samples, but they didn't have enough sequencers and all of their sequencers were un unavailable for other reasons. So my lab was running, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of, of clinical patient samples through our sequencer facilities and helping them analyze the data. Uh, this is outdated, tens of thousands. So that was a really interesting operation. And we were watching the, the waves of vi variants sweeping through Texas 
while the Texas government and the feds were not funding any of this. This was all academic effort because we knew it, it was going to be important, but they didn't. So here's um, a wave that happened very, very quickly in a pandemic, which nobody kind of paid attention to. Um, we did because we could see it on the ground. And this is a mutation called D614G in the spike protein. This is one amino acid mutation that changed in a, in a, a protein that has 1,300 amino acids. So just one amino acid out of 1,300 makes a difference. Um, here's the case counts of this variant. Uh, so D614 was the original Wuhan strain that was uh, de um, deposited by the Chinese CDC. And the G614 substitution was uh, um, the one that swept the globe in a, in a, really, a really interesting sweep. It took about two months to become globally dominant. 100% of all viruses have that variant, right? And we saw that not only did it become globally dominant, but this is patient counts over here, right? So it was clear that um, it wasn't just giving the virus fitness, it was also much more infective for, for humans. Right? And so, you know, uh, the key points are here. We were watched, he was a clinician, so he gets to watch the clinical consequences. We're molecular biologists, we're interested in the viral properties that, that in spike that made it so much more uh, infectious, right? Uh, the good news at that time was that the severity of the disease wasn't changing for that particular mutation. The virus didn't evade first gen vaccines and therapeutics, that was good. Uh, and the mechanism, which was what I was interested in, how did it become so much more mutation, is that one particular mutation just changed the virus shape a little bit so that receptor binding domain, that little green subunit, just flipped up a little better. And by flipping up a little better, it just shifted it to be better at grabbing the cells. And that was enough to drive this massive wave of, of uh, infections in the Houston, greater Houston area. But that brings us to a b bigger problem academically. I mean, I don't want to be chasing the next variant. That's boring academically to me. I mean, evolution will continue, life will go on, new variants will come around. But the problem is we don't know, and we didn't at the time have any clinical or molecular um, tools to rapidly understand the variant landscape. Because um, if you think about it, even to this day, and I'll talk about what we're doing to try to address that. Well, let me show you what I mean by the variant landscape. Let's see. There it is. So this is a quilt plot. Of my, that my student did by a bioinformatics search of the GISAID database. This is the global repository for the genomes of many different viruses, but right now it's basically dominated by SARS-CoV-2. It's at this point roughly about 5 million viral genomes sequenced globally. It's very, very important to understand the viral sequences. Um, this is a, a plot that he made maybe a, a month or two ago, and you can see this area corresponds to the name of the variant. So, uh, I think B117, is uh, that Delta? They renamed them all. These are Delta and Omicron and all these things. They're not scientific. They're not useful to me as a scientist. They're more, there was a political decision to get away from um, names like, you know, the UK variant or the South Africa variant, right? That's not right. Um, so they, they gave them Greek letters. I still forget what they are. Uh, but these are the actual viral clades that we identify. So um, I can't remember. B117, I think maybe Delta. Uh, and certainly BA1 and BA2 are the Omicron variants that have swept most recently, right? And actually, um, for those of us who are virus variant watchers, BA2 is going to lead to another wave in the U.S. in the next two months or so. Just, you heard it here first if you haven't seen it in the news yet. <laughs> You've seen it already? Yeah. Yeah, it's like I can see the cake is baked and it's just frustrating to see the news and everyone catching up, but we're on the ground seeing this happening. It's like, yeah, I got it. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. So, but what's the point? Look at all of this. This is the dark matter of the viral genome. This is clearly clinically relevant because these are patients that have been sequenced for their virus. And we have no idea what all these variants are doing, right? And this can go on to infinity, right? There's low counts here and it just, we just blended it out. Moreover, um, sequencing of the virus is uh, very uneven across the world. And it kind of follows the resource distribution for low and middle income countries, right? We have now, um, in the U.S., fallen on our face, we have all the money and all the equipment to do the right thing, but we didn't. That was a political decision. We won't go there. Uh, so the U.S. actually lags in terms of variant surveillance, surveillance and that has changed in the last two years um, for the better. Um, Canada, the U.K., Denmark, other countries in Europe really lead the way in terms of sequencing. This is 18 sequences per 1,000 cases. Not great, but at least some view into how the virus is changing. Africa is completely dark. Um, of course, um, China keeps data to themselves. 
Um, Russia is dark, and so most of the world is dark. We don't know what's happening. These variants are out there. We don't know what the next Omicron will look like. There's no guarantee that it's going to be less virulent or more virulent. That is a myth, just FYI. But my goal as a molecular biologist is to come in and try to understand. Uh, so, right, we have limited sequencing globally, and we'll be blindsided by the next variant of concern, guaranteed. The problem is this. We're always in a reactionary mode, right? What's going to happen? Another place is going to say, oh my god, all of us are getting sick with a new variant. We've sequenced it. We don't know what it means. A few more weeks will pass. Then we'll say, okay, it's spreading globally. And then, you know, the scientists will get on it. They'll give it a variant of concern designation and everybody will jump on it. By that point, you're, it's done, right? It's going to be spreading globally again. It's a very reactionary mode that we've been in the whole time. My view as a molecular biologist is what can I do to be proactive, to understand what the evolutionary landscape of the virus looks like. It's not infinite. It will not evolve forever, right? Are we at peak fitness? Probably wouldn't want to bet, you know, what is it? What's that Jurassic Park quote? Life finds a way, right? <laughs> wouldn't want to bet against evolution. <laughs> but also, it's not infinite. And also, we'd like to anticipate what's coming, right? So before everybody's falling ill in South Africa or something. So we developed technologies for that. Um, so, trying to stay ahead of the next outbreak, what we need is high throughput ways to understand how the spike protein is changing. By high throughput, I mean not just testing one variant of concern or 10 of them, which we can do with one graduate student working really hard. What we want to understand is can we do this for thousands or tens of thousands of variants that aren't variants of concerns but could be? Can we do this for every possible change in the virus protein and see how that um, changes it? So, this is a complicated picture. I'll try to go through it quickly. It's a schematic picture. Um, and we developed this uh, um, right after we finished the antigen work, which has now been sunset in my lab. We're not doing any more antigen engineering. Uh, but ultimately, what we're doing is we're using this cell display technology where we take mammalian cells and we um, attach via flexible protein tether the spike protein uh, onto the cells. And each cell encodes one variant, one different and unique variant of the spike protein. And we can use let's say antibody binding, these are little antibodies that are fluorescent. By N, I say neutralizing antibodies. We're hyper-focused on antibodies that can have therapeutic potential. Because antibodies remain not only your best protection from getting sick, but if you're, after you are sick, they are the best therapeutic agents as well for infusions. Right? And we've, of course, seen new variants of concern evade our therapeutic antibodies very effectively. So we're looking at therapeutic antibodies, we're looking at binding to the cell surface receptors, and so on. And by using these methods, in addition with a technique called flow sorting, we can really quickly test many different variants for their main properties. And so we have a pretty cool pipeline that my student has built, which includes high throughput cloning and expression. This is all done with robotics and automation, which is really neat. I've, I'm so lucky to work with people who are smarter than me because the students teach me so much, and I really appreciate that they taught me that this can be possible even. Uh, we uh, screen and characterize them using these flow sorting approaches, and in fact, we can use uh, molecular scissors, these uh, spe specific proteases, which are proteins that cut other proteins, in a specific yellow cut site over here, to put them on electron micrographs and, and take pictures of their surface binding properties and so on. So does this work? It does. Here's a, a, a nice fluorescent image of the protein uh, spike decorating the outside of cells, shown over here. So you see the cell nuclei are in blue, and the protein sits on the outside. We can take this, this spike protein off the cells and look at it by electron microscopy. This is a negative scutane electron microscopy grid, and you see this is a very characteristic shape, shape uh, low-resolution reconstruction of what we would expect this mushroom thing to look like. And we can even do um, functional tests. So we know that the spike protein binds the proteinase 2, which is a cell surface protein that it recognizes. And we can measure how that works. Uh, here's SARS-CoV-2 variants. And if they have their receptor binding domain, they bind uh, this ACE2 molecule, which we would expect. If they don't have their receptor binding domain, they can't bind the receptor ACE2. And in fact, in fact, if you look at SARS-CoV-1, it also enters cells via the same receptor. Um, although you can't see the pointer, the viruses, the related coronaviruses, MERS and HKU1, enter cells via a different mechanism, not via the ACE2 mechanism, and as you expect, they're dark in our approach here as well. So this is all controls to show that everything's working. I'm going to show you a busy slide. I don't want you to focus too much on all the details, but I want to give you a flavor for what we can do with this. Uh, maybe with a little editing here. Yeah. So for example, 
we can uh, take a look at variants of concern that already have been out there. This just shows you that the variants of concern are accumulating a lot of mutations in their spike proteins and throughout their genomes relative to the reference strain that we call the Wuhan strain, the original viruses that were taken out of China. Um, so the new Omicron variants, BA1 and BA2, for example, have way more mutations in them. The virus is evolving. It's drifting away from what it started as than their original variants. Um, this shows uh, a heat map of where the mutations are accumulating. Uh, not too surprisingly, from what we know about the immune system, the variants mutations shown in orange here are accumulating in the receptor binding domain, which is a very important antigenic target by immune system, and then the N-terminal domain, which is uh, also, um, so when, also very important for our immune system. So when our immune system generates antibodies, it's basically generating antibodies against this area of the protein and this area of the protein. The rest of the protein is really protected by a glycan shield from our immune system. Okay. So these are the entry points. These are the Achilles heel of the virus. And the virus is mutating like crazy in both of these Achilles heels because we've shifted from a situation where initially our population, our, our, um, the virus was encountering uh, immunologically naive host, i.e. a host that didn't have anti antibodies. So there the evolutionary pressure was divide or spread as quickly as possible. Now the virus is dealing with a largely uh, um, convalescent or vaccinated population. So now the evolutionary pressure is mutate away from existing antibodies, right? So this is a really interesting transition point that the virus is having to deal with. Obviously nature finds a way, life finds a way, and we know where those antibodies are targeting, and not surprisingly, the virus is mutating like crazy in the areas where the antibodies are targeting, okay? So, um, so here's the design. We have these large, large assembly strategies where we can pretty much very quickly build up uh, through modern approaches uh, any kind of virus combination we want. For the spike protein, we can test how it responds to a bunch of antibodies and then uh, measure their biophysical properties. So just, just a flavor of what we're doing. Uh, on this axis here, this is all done by one student now. So the workload has come down from a large team of students working 24-7 to now one student that can do this with their own hands. Uh, so uh, on the x-axis here are a number of different antibodies. The names are not very user-friendly. These are coming from the literature and other laboratories and, and um, companies. Okay? And on the y-axis are little boxes with different circulating variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and various omicrons. Uh, the color bars here represent sensitivity to these neutralizing antibodies. These are all neutralizing antibodies that could have been therapeutic. Some of them were therapeutics. You can notice the Regeneron antibodies that were um, quite popular a little while ago. A reg Regeneron um, antibody cocktail consisted of two therapeutic antibodies. Um, and those were incredibly effective against Wuhan 1. Okay, so if you look at those, they were white, which means they would neutralize. We and others have already seen that um, Omicron BA1, these turn red, which means they no longer work. Right? And so taking a panel of these therapeutic antibodies, what you see very quickly is Omicron is a very obvious outlier. Right? Uh, it, it, is no longer, um, it is no longer affected by almost every single antibody on that list. Yeah? So the only antibodies that are working against Omicron therapeutically, um, so by the way, the Eli Lilly antibody has a funny story, at least Regeneron got their money's worth. Um, they were able to produce their antibodies. This, this is the importance of speed in, in dealing with viral evolution if you're a company. Regeneron made their cocktail relatively quickly in the pandemic. They had scale-up issues, but they were able to get it into people and save a lot of lives, frankly, uh, until Omicron hit and just completely wiped it out. It takes about a billion dollars to get an antibody into a human, right? It's a very expensive process to get a human therapeutic. Um, so they need to make their money fast. The Eli Lilly uh, antibody, Lycov555, was a therapeutic that they got through trial just in time for it to be wiped out by the beta variant and the gamma delta. And so it almost didn't see any patients in real life and they lost a ton of money on it, right? It was also because they had a single antibody and it's much easier for a virus to invade one antibody, one bullet versus two bullets. So anyways, um, but what you're seeing is um, looking at antibodies that target the N-terminal domain in that left panel over there, the N-terminal domain is hypermutable, which means it's uh, probably an antibody sink. We don't actually know what it's doing in the spike protein, 
but pretty much every single variant is very good at evading almost every antibody we can find against the N-terminal domain. It is not a good target for therapeutic antibodies. It's too mutation prone. Um, the RBD, the receptor binding domain, is a little more evolutionarily constrained because the virus has to use it to gain entry into cells. It has a secondary function. We don't actually know what the entity function is. Uh, it has to gain entry into cells, and therefore it has a little bit less mutational space. So the name of the game now uh, is to try to create antibodies that are uh, variant independent. Like, for example, S2H97 is the best in class antibody because you can see it, it gets through any variant, right? More antibodies like that that could be therapeutically useful. Right? And um, the data on the right is actually not done by us, it's done by a colleague and collaborator who's taken these antibodies and correlated the fact that we're doing this. This is a toy system, right? This is not a real virus. This is just one protein. Um, he's actually taken and correlated our findings with real viral infection. This is live SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think it's golden hamster model. I can't remember what the animal model is, where they uh, intranasally inject the virus into the, into the animal, and then they follow up with a therapeutic antibody to see if it rescues the animal from um, SARS-CoV-2 from these various variants. Basically, it shows that what we're measuring is real and important. Okay, so that's a new technology that we've created in the last year to be able to go after this. But this is not very impressive. This is only maybe eight variants of concern. So now I have a, a, a new graduate student, Anker, uh, who's taken on this project, and he's going big. So he's going to try to do every single variant ever measured. Because now we've developed a scalable technology where we can use automation to go after not just one or ten variants, but thousands of different variants. And his goal, and he's very close to doing this, is to be able to measure every single possible amino acid mutation in the protein. Here's just one of the three trimer subunits of the spike protein. And in blue, uh, Anker's plotted, uh, the heat map indicates the mut normalized mutation frequency at that position. So you can see, if you look at the database, a lot of places in this virus, are in this specific protein, are mutation prone. Not at all variants have all mutations, of course, but we want to understand what all of those mutations do because they're going to come up sooner or later. We need to understand the total evolutionary landscape of this virus. All right, so what Anker is doing is developing these uh, ultra-high throughput approaches to define what are variable or maybe invariant functionally important regions of this protein. And the invariant part is the most interesting from my point of view because that's where you want to focus your immune response. If you can find a therapeutic antibody that hits an invariant region of the virus, that's a really important win. Will the virus figure out a way to mutate, mutate something invariant? Probably, because it, it would have a pressure to do so. But it would be important to do that. We want to map where these antibody epitopes are and where the escape mutations can be. And we want to anticipate the effect of mutations that have not yet been observed clinically to stay, to stay ahead of the virus. We also want to use these kinds of technologies to accelerate prefusion stabilization. And that's challenge three. And I'm getting to the end here. Uh, the final challenge is um, to anticipate the next pandemic, not just the next variant. We've got to think bigger. We can't be in a reactionary mode. It's too late by the time a pandemic hits to start all this stuff up. My dream is to be able to have uh, antigens, first generation antigens, they don't have to be perfect, against all of the zoonotically transmittable viruses that are out there. So we can anticipate the next spillover threat. So typically what happens is these viruses have an animal reservoir, frequently bats, bats, and these animal reservoirs can go through either an intermediate host or enter humans directly, typically via an intermediate host that has an immune system that is similar to both species. And this has been recorded for a lot of viruses, right? And it's probably how SARS-CoV-2 came around. So people know this, and, and um, there are very nice prediction uh, work on what are the highest pandemic potential viruses. And this is just a list I took from one such paper. If you look at the top 10 uh, worst actors, they're all coronaviruses. Right. Coronaviruses are diverse, present in bats and many other species, adaptable to our immune systems, and are likely going to cause the next outbreak as well. If it's not influenza, it's going to be a coronavirus. I won't bet the family farm on that, but that's my guess. So um, what we're doing now is uh, we've partnered. How much time do I have? Am I done? OK. So I'll finish with the last slide. So we have a now a large team of folks working across multiple institutions to do just that. So uh, this is not something I could ever do alone in my laboratory, but we are building technologies. Uh, this is a team effort that has come along pretty well. 
uh, where we're building technologies across multiple institutions to develop rapid response capabilities against existing and possible zoonotically transmitted viruses uh, using a large group of people, using expression systems both in yeast, mammalian cells. These are, chi these are hamsters. Chinese hamster ovary cells are very important for production of biotherapeutics. Uh, in plant cells, actually tobacco leaves are very good at making some kinds of antibodies, interestingly. And we're developing a very large team that has a distributed architecture for being able to scale up such things when business interests won't step up. Because the business interest uh, companies like Moderna and Pfizer, they will never step up unless they see a very large market. And so this has to be an academic and government collaboration, at least in the very early stages of a pandemic, where we don't even know, is it going to be a pandemic or is it going to be an epidemic or is it just going to get 10 people sick somewhere in Asia or something like that, right? So this is where we are. I want to conclude with um, a little, a little uh, historical perspective, which I think is important for keeping in mind how far we have come in being able to deal with this response with pandemics. Remember, um, this was incredibly frustrating few years. It's not over yet. And a lot of people have suffered greatly uh, in terms of health and economics and so on. But this has been the most amazing development of a therapeutic I have ever seen in my life and you have ever seen in your life. This is the age of biology. Um, this graph plots the, um, the length it takes, the length of time it takes to get a, a pandemic uh, or to get a, a viral vaccine or a vaccine into uh, clinical use. And the typical modern development cycle can be on the order of 10 to 15 years. That's typical to get a vaccine into humans. Uh, with the coronavirus, note the first human trial to the large clinical trials and, the, and, and uh, rollout to the general population was one year. That process was shortened tenfold over you know, the next best uh, uh, technologies out there. So there's been an amazing push to be able to make vaccines go faster. And that's going to pay dividends in many areas of biology and many areas of, of uh, medicine uh, that we haven't yet began to see. So there is a silver lining to all of this. There's a lot of vaccines out in production now with very different technologies. There will be second generation vaccines that will do better. The US may not benefit from them, but the technologies will be around um, for when the next big thing comes. And finally, I just want to mention that none of this was done by me. None of this. This was all done by the students in the lab who are no different than you. Uh, and they're continuing to do this work. This is a snapshot of my lab oh, circa six months ago. The people in the boxes are the ones who started this project. Jeff, Kamyab, Jamie. Kamyab continues to develop the high throughput technologies. And Anker has recently taken on the role of, uh, of really getting this thing to, the, to be able, getting our technologies to the point where we can really do pandemic preparedness beyond SARS-CoV-2. Finally, I want to mention that if any of this sounds interesting to you, send me an email. I'm always excited to work with um, next generation of students who are excited to do something important as well as learn a little bit about biology. And so with that, I'd like to stop and thank you for your attention. Any question for Dr. Finkelstein? Yeah, what's up? Um, is there like a, a simple explanation for why bats serve as a reservoir for potential future infections to humans? That's a good question. It's not just bats, um, civets also. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of two things. Clearly, they're able to tolerate coronaviruses. So to them, it's not that bad. Right? It doesn't wipe their populations out. And secondly, their cell surface receptors happen to be quite similar to our cell surface receptors. Right? So if you can imagine if the virus, I mean, like mammalian biology is not super different, but there are some d differences. And if, if our biology is too far apart, then if a virus does make a transmission, it'll just not be able to replicate and it'll just be suppressed by the immune system. But it turns out that bats and humans happen to have a relatively similar immune system or not immune system, relatively similar biology, molecular biology of cell surface receptors, and these viruses can make that transition. There's also been a lot of examples of transmission from household pets, right? The animal reservoir for, for, for coronaviruses is just incredibly large. 
So, you know, like all deer have now have had a SARS-CoV-2 infection. I don't know if you've seen this. Europe called uh, all of its uh, civets and mink population because there was massive retransmission between uh, human handlers and their civets, which they were farming for um, fur reasons, which is another problem that they sh should have gotten rid of that a long time ago. But, you know, people will buy fur. So um, that, that was outlawed because of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, another silver lining. Uh, mostly because um, when they transmit back and forth between animals and humans, it gives a virus a, large, a chance to make a large evolutionary leap as well. So there's other problems with variants emerging through these kinds of transmissions. Yeah? So these mutations that we're seeing, you, you focused on the spike protein itself. What about the rest of the virus? Are there any mutations? Tons of mutations. Nobody knows what they're doing. They're clearly important. So there was just a recent report that the N protein, which is another surface or receptor protein, or surface protein, uh, it does not um, spike, and it, does not, it is not important for you know, vaccine design and so on. But um, there is a gain of function mutations in N in the recent variants that also increase transmissibility. So it's a question of what you're asking, right? I'm hyper-focused on therapeutics and you know, vaccines. Uh, prophylactics and therapeutics, if you're interested in the biology of the virus and what makes it a better variant, why it outcompetes other variants, uh, then it's clear that there's a lot of other stuff going on. But you can't make a therapy out of it, so I'm not going to spend my time on it. Yeah. Do any of your mutations alter the ability to, to bind sugars? Probably yes. Hard to study. Good question. Yeah. So, for example, lots of viruses enter via sugars instead of via cell surface proteins. Um, there is some talk that there's a backup entry pathway. So if you knock out ACE2 in cells, um, you can still get a SARS-CoV-2 viral entry. So there must be a backup pathway, uh, and, and sugars are likely the way it goes. It's probable that the N-terminal domain interacts with sugars. It's not the main entry point, though. Um, so, yes. It's likely, it's again one of these things that it's, it's definitely a secondary effect, uh, which is not going to be something I go into. You know. But for some viruses, it's critical, that the sugar entry mechanisms. Yeah. Other questions? To triggering? Yes. Well, let me see how I should answer that question. There's 50 to 200 spike proteins per virus particle. They don't need to all work. Secondly, the virus particle wants them to exist in this metastable state. So at any one time, a certain percentage of them can be triggered early, right? They're like, they're like little springs, ready to spring open. And if, you know, 10% of them or 20% of them on a viral particle spring open prematurely, it doesn't matter. It just needs to get one or two of them to work to enter your cells. And it wants them to be really, really ready to go, spring-loaded. Um, for antigen design, that's a bad idea, right? Because you want it to be stuck in a state that the immune system can actually have time to make the antibodies, uh, mature affinity mature the antibodies that would actually hit it. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's likely more stable on the virus as well. I didn't mention it, but we cut off bits and pieces of it because we can't get it to be, it wasn't too important. We're actually presenting the ectodomain, which is a soluble fraction, and it's missing some things on the N-terminus and some things on the C-terminus. And that's you know, a little detail. But those things are doing something, <laughs> which, again, for training the immune system, it doesn't matter. Oh, students first, sorry, with all due respect. I have a question about the sugars, actually. Um, if that's our, a, a next place that you're going to look at, how are you going to differentiate it from the sugars that we need and that we're going, like, difference between us and virus? Yeah, so let's see. There's sugars all over the place in this question. I, I should note that when I say sugars, that's shorthand. There's sugar, sugars are, like, there's lots of different sugars. So I guess the short answer is the sugars that you eat are not the same sugars that are present on the viral spike protein. This is the glycan shield that people talk about. And they're not the same as the sugars that your cells present on their cell surface. So there's no danger in, you know, like keep putting sugar in your coffee, it's fine. <laughs> there's no danger in too much sugar in your coffee causing you to be more susceptible or something to the virus. 
But studying the, the viral glycans is a very important field of research because that glycan shield across the spike, those little wiggly um, lima beans that you saw in that video, um, are one of the reasons why the viruses are so good at evading our immune system. They hide themselves from the immune system. And so understanding how the viral, glycom, uh, viral, gly viral glycans protect the virus is really, really important. Again, from my perspective, it's not a therapeutic, so I can't, it's not, it dilutes my effort away from what we could have done to help the pandemic response right now. You know, the thing about science is it really, just as a side to the students, you know, I know you guys know this, but it's an infinite set of questions, many of them fascinating. And it's always a challenge to me to sort of decide this is the path I'm going to be on and I'm going to be laser focused on solving this one problem because there's so many fun problems to work on and you, re you raise a good one and you raise a good one and it's just like there's so many good questions to work on but if I'm going to make an, a difference in this pandemic I got to work on the thing that can get into humans right so that's that's just my philosophy on these things I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Are you are you talking about ant antivirals? I didn't hear you. No, I'm talking about like why we are not producing like a kind of prep like in HIV. Kind of preps. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, this medication you, you like so uh, medication people um, take when they're exposed to HIV and then yeah, like antivirals, yeah. like small molecule antivirals. But why are we more? We focusing are. We are. On the not vaccine? me. Not my research okay. group. But of course, there was a big antiviral push, and you know, it, yeah. But we have two on the market right now. I want to ask you, like, what is your point of view for you focusing on the vaccine more than on this antiviral? Why and why didn't you choose? Yeah. Well, so let's see. We were, this came this 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 came up this came up at dinner. So part of it is opportunistic. I was able to do that because that's what I know. Antivirals take a completely different, you know, pharmacokinetic, pharmacology expertise, which isn't my expertise. Second, um, vaccines will save a lot more lives than antivirals, to be honest. The availability of, so first of all, vaccines were pushed out in a year and they saved a lot of lives, and a lot of suffering. The antivirals are just now barely becoming available in first world countries, right? If you think about it, I don't know if any of you here have tried to procure the Pfizer antiviral, you still can't get it, right? The one from Merck, you can, but it's got a 30% efficacy, so good luck with that. Better than zero, but yeah. So they definitely are a very important component. It's very hard to have antivirals that work. Look at the flu. How much money have we poured into the flu? We have one, Tamiflu, and it kind of sort of works. But that's it, one. Look at HIV. How much money and decades of work have we poured into it? It's a hard business. And the vaccines needed to be here yesterday. So that's what we put our time into. Let's thank Dr. Finkelstein uh, one more time. We have seminars to go to starting at 2.10, so let's get going. <laughs>